uh, Donald Clendenning, and I'm a member of the Independent Fire Company. At that time, when I first joined, was in Charlestown. Now it's Charlestown Ranson, actually located in Ranson. And I joined in 1961. I've been a member now for, I guess, 48 years. Um, I served in various capacities as firefighter, ambulance attendant, uh, fire company training officer, uh, certified through West Virginia University. Um, and uh, I became vice president sometime during the, over the years, and I was became president of the Independent Fire Company in 1975 and served in that capacity until 2002. And, uh, over the years, uh, we've been exposed to many, many you know, very trying situations, I guess, as far as uh, one situation in particular that I'll probably never forget is uh, in the old Wright Denny uh, school fire. And uh, Dewey Perks and myself, I think Dewey was a lieutenant maybe at that time, we were up in the very top of that building with a two and a half inch fire hose when the whole roof fell in on us. <laughs> and uh, a very large timber hit my helmet. It was so close to me when it came down, it hit my helmet and also hit part of Dewey. Knocked my helmet off, bounced off my chest, knocked the hose out of her hands. and. Uh, Frightened Dewey, well, frightened all of us, really, both of us, but frightened Dewey to the point where he jumped up in my arms and grabbed me around the neck. I thought he was going to choke me to death. I ended up, we were able to, it was smoky, we couldn't see anything by that time. But anyhow, we found the steps. Uh, I actually ended up carrying Dewey down, down the steps. <laughs> so, I mean, that was one thing that I don't think he or I, either one, will ever forget. Uh, going back over the years in there, uh, years of ambulance service it used to be quite common for some ladies to uh, wait to the last minute to give birth and they would call for the ambulance service to come and deliver their infant for them and uh, so I, uh, I was involved with seven of those deliveries in my service years uh, Clark Fur, who was our chief back in those days uh, he was one of our primary instructors, particularly in the fire, well, in the ambulance service and the fire service, but I think Clark had actually delivered 56 infants. <laughs> and uh, there were a couple occasions when uh, a couple of ladies actually fussed at us if we got them to the hospital instead of delivering the baby because that way they had to pay the doctor bill. <laughs> that was the story they told us anyhow, they actually fussed at us. but. Um, Many situations over the year. Miller Chemical Fire, where we lost one of our uh, firemen in that fire. Uh, obviously, that's something that nobody will ever forget, anybody that was involved with it anyway. But other than that, uh, you know, just the ongoing. So actually, when I became president of the Independent Fire Company, we were in the facility downtown across from the courthouse on George Street, which is now occupied by the Visitor Center and uh, we occupied two floors of that building. And the, the quarters was so tight, you, you actually scraped the walls uh, when you backed the equipment in. You had to really be careful about that. And uh, when I became president, I think we had like $5,000 in the bank and owed three times that much and uh, didn't own our own facility or anything else other than a few pieces of equipment. And then, in the 90s, we were able to purchase the old Potomac Edison property, which is where we are now in, in Ranson, and renovated and added on to that, which the members did a tremendous amount of the interior renovation. It saved the company an awful lot of money. And over the years, we were extremely fortunate to be named as heirs in quite a few wills that we were able to pay our renovation costs off and our all of our debts and the independent fire company today is nearly debt free and uh, has some reserves which uh, I'm pretty I'm pretty proud of and uh, I, during my time period I have to say we I was very fortunate I was always a conservative person myself so we were I, I felt I was very fortunate to have a like thinking board of directors because if somebody left us some money we didn't run out and spend it we 
we put it away. We kept it for rainy days when we really had to have it. And uh, also our philosophy was we didn't buy a piece of equipment unless it was absolutely justified. And we very well could justify it and prove we needed it. We didn't just buy something for a toy. Uh, that was that was always my philosophy, and I was fortunate to have a strong board of directors that felt pretty much the same way. Uh, some of the other areas that uh, always in, uh, impressed your mind as far as uh, I don't know how to say that, but uh, just things that always uh, impressed you as uh, human interest kind of things is, uh, for instance, when you'd have a river rescue, and uh, in those days we didn't have the equipment and boats that we have now. Usually when we went to a river rescue, it was to uh, hook somebody that was underwater and drag them out. We rarely saved anybody's lives. By the time we got there, had they been underwater long enough, they usually were gone. Although there were a couple of occasions where we were able to get uh, people out and revive them. Uh, one of the uh, scariest times that I was ever involved with was one that wasn't in the river. It was actually in a, a, a local motel swimming pool uh, in the city of Charlestown. And a little girl that had drowned in there looked uh, enough like my oldest daughter to, to have been her twin. And I, uh, it, uh, Although I knew she was home, I, somehow I just had it in my mind that was my daughter. And uh, certainly I'll never forget that either. But thank the Lord it turned out not being my daughter. But those are one of the scary things that really hits you and anybody that's in these services will probably run across that kind of thing sooner or later in their lives. Um, leadership roles uh, are, are certainly one of the things I think the Independent has been extremely fortunate in retaining people long enough for them to thoroughly learn the, the services, fire service and ambulance service, although we have all kinds of mandatory uh, requirements as far as training. If you don't keep the people there long enough to get through it all, you, you're never going to be as strong as for, we've been fortunate enough to be because uh, the state has requirements, but we also have our own requirements with, within the department. Uh, speed limits is an example. We, uh, we have a 10 mile an hour over the, over the posted speed limit as a maximum for our equipment to travel. And the city limits same thing. They can't, and they have to stop at red lights and stop signs. Uh, we we have actually taken people off the driver's list because they were found guilty of violating our rules, um, and we have actually suspended people for violating uh, operating procedures and practices. And so, uh, going back to the leadership, I'm very. Uh, I have to say, the independent in particular has been very fortunate to have people stay with us a long time to learn the rules and to know what, how important it is to uh, follow procedures and policies. I think that's been a strong point in our company. And you can, by the way, Don, you can, you can keep, I'll keep the tape running. You can say, stop, let me, you know, you can stop yourself and, and start over again at a certain point and I'll okay. just take it out. Okay, you're on. All right, there's uh, other, other interesting facts about the independent in particular in that, uh, the length of our administrative people in particular, uh, the Independent Fire Company, Charlie Reiniger was president for, good Lord, I'm going to have to guess this, probably for 40 years. <laughs> and, uh, and then I became president for 27 years and L.J. Watson is president. So we've maintained uh, very lengthy service out of our administrative people as well as some of uh, our directors and, and other officers. Our fire chief, uh, Clark Fur, was chief of fire service and ambulance service for, I forget that, but it, it was an awful long time also, probably 25 or 30 years. And then Ernest Hauser stayed as chief for many years before Ed became chief. I think uh, Ed's been chief now for, geez, I'm not sure, but probably close to 15 years or more. <laughs> so I think that adds to, uh, to the fact that people get to uh, really appreciate and depend the leadership of an organization such as the fire company. We also organized many years ago a junior squad in our fire company. 
And uh, so anyone that has children in, uh, in an age bracket of uh, 15 to 18 that needs something to do, they <clears throat> might want to visit the Independent and, and talk to someone about joining uh, the junior squad there because uh, there are limitations on what they can do, but on the other hand, there are many, many things that they can do to learn to become fire and ambulance personnel uh, without being jeopardized with unsafe conditions because we do have pretty strict rules on that. And uh, they are well protected and, and looked after very closely. Uh, <clears throat> another thing that might be interesting to someone is uh, the fact that my wife Alice, uh, although I was president of the fire company for 27 years, my wife Alice has been president, uh, very active and president of uh, auxiliary for quite a few years too, and I'm not going to guess at how many years, she may not want me to tell you, but <laughs> she's been president of the auxiliary for many years, and uh, the independent fire company auxiliary is not just a ladies auxiliary, it is also men and women join the independent fire company auxiliary. So if anyone has interest in becoming an auxiliary member, don't hesitate to make it known and, and come and visit us. Okay, there's been many questions about why does a person even become a volunteer in the emergency services such as fire and ambulance. And uh, I guess there's a personal pride in your accomplishments and in the, in the ability to help people in their times of need without monetary reward because we certainly don't get paid for it. And uh, the other half of that, I guess, is simply uh, some inherent feeling within me of uh, a need to help in a community service manner. Uh, but many people who have the opportunity to leave something to the fire companies uh, through a will or whatever manner, uh, a trust fund or anything, that money is all going directly back to the communities in the ability to provide service and save lives and properties within our community. You're on. Okay, I'm, I'm going to pass on a, a story that's probably uh, kind of a little bit on the funny side. After you stop and look back at it, it wasn't funny at the time, but uh, one of our older members that, that was, he was very active in doing everything that he could do around the fire station but he couldn't drive or anything because of his age, but he would always kind of get a kick out of when we were in the old station downtown, he would reach in across to the passenger seat and turn the ignition key on, start the motor for the whoever would happen to be the driver coming along to get that piece of equipment out of the way so the truck behind it could get out. And this one particular time, he reached over and turned the ignition on, and so, so be it, the darn motor started even though it was in gear. And it, it, it actually tore the whole door down in, in the engine bay, tore the door clear out, ran across the street, and ran into to the judge's car parked across the street. <laughs> so that was one of the serious but funny things that happened. Of course, after that, we had to ask him not to start the truck anymore. <laughs> At least not that way.